This is Nifty Culture. I'm Pio. And this morning, I have the pleasure of speaking with the first artist in the NFT space that I was ever able to interview, Mr. Jonathan Thunder. How's it going, Jonathan? Good, man. What's up, Pio? Not much, man. I'm really excited to talk to you again. Um, I appreciate you giving me a shot for that first interview a few months back um, after your uh, initial Nifty Gateway drop. to be here to talk about your Seagate popping next week, correct? Yeah, correct, man. Thanks for having me back. It's uh, been great to watch everything you guys have been covering. It's nice, it's nice to be uh, nice to be back in your presence, sir. <laughs> Appreciate it, man. So, you know, focusing on on this drop moving forward, but also just, you know, you being about three months at this point into the NFT space. Um, I know when we first spoke, you were kind of just, you know, recovering from like almost the shock of the success of your first drop in March. Um, and, you know, you were kind of like just trying to figure out which way was up. Right. And so now you've had a few months to kind of unwind, to process things. And, and really, I, I'm assuming to kind of enjoy the success and focus on what you want to do moving forward. So, you know, three months in, what are kind of your thoughts on the NFT space so far? And, um, you know, what have you been up to? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> three months ago, I guess I, I must have, you know, you could probably say I was an NFT baby, NFT artist baby. <laughs> um, I feel like I've learned a lot since then, just uh, connecting to uh, other artists, um, you know, sitting in and listening, you know, in uh, some of the spaces where people talk about what's going on, just following along with the drops and uh occasionally having a chance to connect with a, a collector who's just sort of letting me know you know like how they're doing and um you know their their take on the work their take on you know like being a collector and uh it's uh you know it's been it's been a growing experience it's kind of helped me uh transform um a little bit of how i approach uh my work and uh um and not like in a uh you know like a transformative way but more of like in a, a liberating way so <clears throat> i've definitely been uh keeping busy you know with the uh with the nft space um it's always good to just uh make sure to keep tapped in but i've also been uh doing you know some other stuff as far as uh getting you know like paintings like let me see if i can do that there we go paintings like that you know ready for uh, some some live exhibits and also uh displaying digital canvases which was about 50 percent of my practice prior to coming to the nft space and that's still ongoing yeah i remember when you were talking about digital canvases i think you called them vignettes right where it's almost mm -hmm. like it's yep. a it's a moving painting and i remember seeing like you know examples of those exhibits when i was checking out your work on your website and it's obviously so cool um are we going to be seeing those in the next nft drop and nft drops moving forward yeah we'll be seeing some of those digital canvases here and a couple of uh you know other goodies Nice, nice. Sounds good. Um, and so, you know, you have been getting more and more involved or, or just like, you know, kind of getting deeper into the NFT space, obviously, since the first drop, just considering that, you know, again, it was a successful one. We have the second one coming up. Um, have you, what have you found in terms of like the community building part of NFTs? Like, have you been able to really connect with your collectors and maybe even connect with other artists that are in the space? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, uh, I have been actually uh, able to connect with some of the other artists and some of the collectors that have reached out, um, you know, and it's it's interesting how these friendships can form online and uh, just become, you know, like, I guess, a, a voice, you know, like sort of in the in the in the digital ether that, uh, you know, talks about what you're into so that's been really refreshing um and it's also you know been interesting to see how other artists will uh there's no i've i've I found that there's no like one set career path for an nft artist it's it's all 
you know, like in the same venue, but uh, the artists that I've been able to connect with each sort of have an approach and uh, they have things in the NFT space that they like, you know, that they'll get into. And that's almost the sort of um, uh, sub community of the NFT space that they kind of fall into. And it's, it's cool to watch how that affects, you know, like their progress and their work and how they promote, promote their work and uh, get into things like, um, you know, clubs, avatars, stuff like that. And then uh, different auctions on different venues. Nice, nice. So we're going to dive into some of the work right here. Uh, I'm going to pull it up for us. Um, so uh, you sent me a, a bunch of different pieces. Are these all going to be involved with this drop? Like, will all of these be available to collectors in one way or another? <clears throat> right now, I'm about 95% sure uh, about them. Um, this first piece, I actually... Uh, I don't think will be in the, the drop. It's still in that folder <clears throat> because I wanted them to be able to take a look at it. But um, I don't So we won't worry about that one. I don't want to tease people. I don't want to show mm -hmm. people something that they won't be able to buy. <laughs> right, right. I was actually thinking about taking it out of the background here, but um, yeah, no, we don't, we, don't, uh, we don't need to talk about that one because I, I don't think it made the drop. Nice. But what about this one? So this is a, yeah, this is part of a four piece set. Um, we'll probably see a few of those included in the drop in some way or another. Um, I don't want to reveal too much, but I'm trying to uh, wor work it out where uh, collectors, people who already have a piece of mine will get one of these, uh, I'm calling them bear wearing rabbit skull mask and the bear <laughs> all right the bear kind of goes back to uh more of a personal setting for me um uh, in, in my tribe system we inherit clans from our parents and the bear clan is my clan so uh bears are meant to be like uh, protectors healers uh sort of watch out for other people but the rabbit um is often portrayed as a trickster uh, type of character. So uh, these are two identities that I often associate with, and I'm trying to put them in a uh, sort of contemporary setting with the design work that's going on on the side here. It references uh, Ojibwe floral patterns, which is similar to um, some of the work that you see in artists like, uh, uh, I think his name is Jason Seif, uh, who uh, references his Persian rugs. Uh, yep. Ojibwe floral pattern is almost identical to that stuff and how it's constructed. So I've sort of made a twist on it in this piece right here, putting in a, uh, one of my favorite games that uh, I still play anytime I come across it, which is Pac-Man and Miss Pac-Man. Nice, nice. I mean, it's an, a very, very interesting piece and kind of knowing a little bit of context for the background makes it more powerful. Um, and people should know that, you know, these are physical paintings, right? So you paint these on canvas and then they be, they're they turned into NFTs unless they're like a moving picture, which is more of like your vignette, vignette style, which we'll get to. But these are right. physical yep. canvases. Yep. These are, these are painted on pieces of wood. Nice, nice, awesome. Okay, so let's uh, move into the next one. So if we look at this, this is the the second piece in the kind of in the collection. Yeah, this this is a uh, the same uh, kind of concept, except for I've sort of thrown in more of an old school uh, gangster kind of feel to it. Um, throwing a couple dice in there, you know, maybe referencing a hot summer day with the ice cream cone. Uh, a couple face tattoos, you know, signifying maybe this guy's been around a couple times. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, and a slight nod to like the Adidas stripes. Yeah, no, really, really cool work again. Um, and very in line with your sort of style of painting, the combination of, you know, things that are like very modern, like the face tats, the dice, the ice cream cone, but then obviously major nods and major influence from your Ojibwe heritage. So I think people will really appreciate that. Oh, wow. So this is just an awesome, awesome, you know, pack of, of, uh, of work right here. I don't know how to describe a collection of work. 
Thanks, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. You know, it, it's interesting. Uh, I just had a few days to put these together and, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Inspiration comes from intensity. So uh, I've just been hammering them out and the creative decisions that happen on the fly. I've been listening to Mixmaster Mike while I'm painting them. Uh, oh, yeah. And, you know, it's just like his uh, creative sort of like recipe is just totally random. And that's kind of the, the spirit that I've been using while I've been painting these. And uh, you can see this is sort of the same thing. He's got a little face tattoo and some Ojibwe floral reference to blueberries, which is uh, big, you know, in, in Ojibwe floral patterns. And um, a, uh, I guess you could say like a Super Mario Brothers style uh, bomb type of character really cool and i see the x's over the eyes is that in line with the bomb uh you know that was just intuitive i just tossed those in there uh, i was just kind of thinking that uh, that would be an interesting way to do the the eye highlights instead of just your random little dot or something just trying to keep it stylized you know the x's over the eyes are sort of i guess something that i think about when i think about uh you know, like cartoons, old school cartoons, like black and white Popeye or something. If somebody got punched out or like if they were supposed to be dead, you know, X's like over the eye. eyes. Yeah. Yeah. That's oh, really cool, man. And, and the blueberries. So uh, is that is blueberries being present in the Ojibwe um, artwork because blueberries were like a key uh, good to be able to forage? Like when they were living off the land, like blueberries were a big time, um, your source of nutrition. Yeah, they, they grow wild around here uh, in Ojibwe country. Um, my wife is a, uh, she is an indigenous food advocate, which means that she just basically edu helps educate people on what foods are locally growing in the wild. And I went on a walk with her recently where she was just doing some research and we found blueberries everywhere. It was insane. And, uh, you know, for me personally, just having sort of lived, you know, more of an artist career, artist life. Um, that's not something that I had a lot of access or uh, education on until uh, I met her. And then she's been able to sort of um, clue me into those things. And then I knew about the Ojibwe floral patterns, you know, and how there would be blueberries and strawberries also grow wild here. So uh, you'll see some of those and some of that work. But um, I guess that's the connection. You know, that's the connection is that it uh, it's a it's a food that was used. And a lot of these patterns uh, will reference maybe like a recipe or something, you know, like that was medicine to the person who designed it. And uh, in this case, yeah, I guess you could say that I happen to be a fan of blueberries. So uh, I think I just had some on some yogurt with granola yesterday. <laughs> no, it's not very modern. exciting, but uh, it's good stuff. Yeah, that's the modern, the modern use of blueberries. Buy a yogurt or something. Okay. Um, all right. And this is the fourth in this in this collection, right? Yeah, this this is the this is the fourth one. Um, this was actually the first one that I painted. This was the prototype, and uh, a little more uh, in line with what I would consider, you know, something you might see, you know, like beaded or um, embroidered or something like that. Aside from the little dagger, you know, and that was sort of my, uh, I guess the left turn that I took at Albuquerque where I was just like, you know, I think I'm going to take this in a different direction and see where it goes. And you, you're talking about when you moved to Albuquerque, you know, to, to pursue your art, right? It was that you went to design school there? Uh, I, I did go to design school in there, but um, in, so in old Bugs Bunny cartoons, he would be burrowing and he would pop up in the middle of trouble and he'd say, I should have took a left at Albuquerque. I don't know why. Okay. It's like, yeah, and then all of a sudden, you know, somebody be trying to blow his head off or something. So is that like talking about the decision that you took to to do your artwork in the way that you do? Oh yeah, yeah. That was just a joke about. Uh, it's more. It was more intuitive. You know, like I just decided to take a different turn with it because I wasn't. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with these pieces. You know, I was just kind of painting and uh, just jamming out and drinking a lot of espresso and uh that's what happened and then uh that influenced the other three pieces 
Nice. All right. Well, that those four are incredibly cool. I'm excited to to continue to look here. Um, so let's pull up one of these. So this is a vignette, right? Yep. <clears throat> Horse mask on ghost is uh, is what I've been calling this piece, and the idea behind the piece is uh, it's about uh, our progress in life. Well, so <clears throat> let me back up just a little bit. <clears throat> Masks are obviously, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so let me back up just a little bit. Masks sure. are obviously something that uh, reoccurs in my work. And masks are uh, a couple things to me. They're about, you know, identity, the identities we uh, are given, the identities we assume, um, the identities that our uh, communities maybe hand us, you know, but uh, in this case, uh, this this particular piece is about the messages that we receive in life, about our calling, you know, about um, what we're, you know, maybe supposed to do or so a change that's going to happen. And uh, sometimes we, we're not open to receiving those messages. You know, I've I know I've had a few times in my life where Somebody was saying, it's time to do this, you know, or, uh, hey, you don't miss out on this. And maybe not in those words, and maybe it wasn't like a person telling me that, but life kind of saying, you know, all right, it's time it's time for you to uh, go in this direction. And there have been times where I jumped right on it, and other times where I'm thinking, oh, man, I should have did that like a year ago. So uh, that's, that's kind of what this piece is about, you know, just sort of uh, being open to these messengers. And I wanted to give it, uh, the reason why it's called horse mask on ghost is because ghosts, you know, are something that's associated with being something that you might turn around and run away from. But, uh, you know, sometimes those scary messages in life are what we need, you know, that's what we need to bring us to the next level and, uh, just kind of like be the person that we're meant to be. For sure. I mean, it's a beautiful piece and, and this started as a physical painting, right? Yeah, this this started as a canvas. Uh, it was like a thirty by forty inch canvas, and um, I made a couple of them. Uh, one of them I painted while I was on residency in Santa Fe for a gallery that was down there, and then I came home and made another one for an exhibit here at the Duluth Art Institute in town, and uh, that was the piece that I decided to turn into a digital canvas for another exhibit, and that ended up turning into this piece right here nice well it's so cool that you're able to turn those canvases into something that like just looks like it always was meant to be um you know a moving piece like a, a 3d or a digital piece so props to you on that um so let's look at i guess we got this is called quarantine grandma's house is that right yep quarantine grandma's house so that, that piece is, uh, it was probably painted in, I would say maybe June of 2020, uh, maybe July. No, nah, it was probably more like June. Um, and I was, you know, just sitting at home watching the news, probably like everybody else trying to figure out, you know, what to do, what not to do. And, uh, um, the general the general surgeon was uh, on TV just talking a little bit about um, you know who what communities might be at risk and uh, uh, one of the highest risk communities is uh, according to the news at that time is Native American communities so I was a little curious about why that would be and I kind of looked into some of the um, social uh, elements of it. And I think one of the uh, one of the things that I found was that um, a lot of times, you know, in a in like, let's say, you know, like in a native community back home on the res, it's common to see more than one generation living under the same roof. So you got multiple people come and going. And yeah. uh, I wanted to paint a scene where this extended family was all living under the same roof, trying to quarantine, trying to stay safe, still trying to have a good time, you know, and do their thing. And you got all sorts of elements, the uh, the uncle who sort of tapped into tradition kind of in the middle. 
being helped by some uh, little Mario Brothers style uh, turtle helpers, maybe like his little <laughs> spirit helpers. Uh, you also got the uncle with a beer and a bong who just keeps telling stories <laughs> to the kids. <laughs> and a uh, little nod to the healthcare workers, a um, little nod to video game culture, because I'm sure a lot of video games were being played, you know, during lockdown times in cities. Uh, grandma and grandpa obviously holding down the door. And um, if you go over to the left, you'll see some food. Uh, another uh, reference to indigenous food systems, which is um, in Ojibwe culture. It's uh, it was tradition to snare rabbits. Um, so I wanted to put a rabbit in the cooking pot, but I didn't want it to be any old rabbit. Uh, there was a, a movie back in the 80s called The Twilight Zone. And in that movie, there was a scene where this kid has the power to do anything that he wants. And one of the things that he does is he traps his entire family in a house with him and uh, makes them watch cartoons. And when the uncle is complaining about how they watch the cartoon over and over again, he gets the rabbit to come out of the TV and it looks exactly like this thing and basically scares the shit out of the uncle. So um, I wanted to bring that back just to show, you know, like that it was an eerie setting that we were all living in at the time. And uh, also just because I love that film, you know, and then there's like a walleye in the pan um, where I come from in Red Lake. Uh, the Ojibwe word for it is Oga Conning, which means the place of the walleye because walleye fishing there is pretty prominent. And uh, a bison in the oven. Um, there's a, a cat on the floor, which is uh, a reference to the lynx. And um, here in Minnesota, where we got uh, Lake Superior, uh, there's a, a story about an underwater lynx that sort of like governs and uh, watches over the water, you know, sort of like protects it, which is uh, also stuff that you see in my work. Um, themes about uh, just our balance with the natural world and, uh, you know, how we exist in it. And then I wanted to comment down a little bit on the left side over there and just show a scene where a mother is just teaching her daughter, you know, a safe practice, which is something that we were all being told is to wash your hands. So um, they're just kind of washing their hands together and uh, they baked a cake or I mean a pie. They baked a little pie, which uh, the grape ape, I don't know if you ever seen the grape ape cartoon. It was way back in like the eighties. Uh, it was this character that would just say grape ape. And that was like his only line. <laughs> And he was like the star of the show, but it was his only line. Um, I wanted to uh, make a contrast between uh, what's happening on the far right, which is a reference to the pandemic and something on the far left being a reference to uh, the natural world. And um, I've heard stories about uh, Sasquatch or Bigfoot uh, being part of basically that balance, you know, the keeper of the forest or like the man in the woods or something like that. But I didn't want to paint Bigfoot the way that, you know, everybody renders Bigfoot. I thought it would be more interesting if I sort of made him look like the grape ape as a nod to one of my favorite childhood cartoons. And uh, it, it, uh, it also uh, sort of symbolizes basically just... Um, as we were we were all inside, uh, it seems that Mother Nature was uh, sort of given a chance to to rest a little, you know, and uh, just sort of recoup a little bit. And that that's why that's in there. Yes, yeah, an incredibly cool piece, man. I appreciate you sharing that level of detail on, you know, kind of what went into it. I do see coronavirus there on the outside trying to get in. Um, so that's uh, definitely a nice touch, too. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a powerful piece for a lot of ways, but it still has your kind of like playful nature, your and, and then a nod to a lot of the things that we see in your work, like the cartoons and the video games and the pop culture references that are important to you. So definitely uh, hats off to you for that one. So let's take a look 
look at this. So I, I'm very familiar with this one. I put this in um, the intro of the last interview that we did because I thought it was so cool. Mm. So is this going to be available for purchase as an NFT? Uh, this this one I'm undecided on. Uh, right now, this is one that's still up in the air as to whether or not it's going to go in the drop. Uh, there are a couple other pieces that are for sure. But uh, this piece in particular is uh still on the fence and uh this is another piece about our uh relationship to the natural world it's about our balance uh, how we interact with the natural world in this scene there's a trickster uh character who's taking off with all of our pollinators and uh it's um influenced by uh ojibwe star people stories where uh in these stories, we've interacted with people from um, other worlds who have come here to either help us move forward uh, with our uh, technologies and then uh, become a part of our world in some way. And in this one, uh, they're taking something away as, uh, you know, trickster, tricksters often do. Wow. Yeah, definitely a really cool way to kind of show that. Um, and is this, you know, on wood or is this on canvas? This one is actually painted on a big uh, five by four foot canvas. Yeah, that's so cool. I mean, I'd love to be able to see it in person. That must be pretty uh, powerful to see because that's five by four feet. That's that's not a small canvas, you know? No, no. I, I really like to go for the uh, kind of like bigger canvases. It just seems more, um, you know, more of an undertaking and I can fit more into it, you know, more story. It's just easier to uh, explore the space. For sure. For sure. So, yeah, I mean, we have a couple more here, the lighthouse. So is this going to be available? I know that this is um, after you painted, when you painted over kill the wabbit, this is the piece that you painted, correct? Yeah, this, this piece was, on the exact same canvas that Kill the Wabbit was. Uh, as many know, I painted over the canvas with black paint. And uh, during that time, I it was there was a lot of uh, wintry days here in Duluth where uh, you know I was kind of looking out at the lake, and it seemed like everything was uh, different uh, tones of gray. So I started to paint the lake and the lighthouse in tones of gray. And, uh, I, you know, at the same time, I was just kind of thinking about everything that was going on in the world and um, how there was a lot of uh, political and social unrest and um, lots of move movements happening uh, everywhere. And here in Minnesota, you know, and uh, in my hometown of Minneapolis, where I grew up, uh, there was quite a bit um, happening by way of, um, uh, you know, just like uh, movements where people, you know, were like making a lot of noise to try to get um, issues to the front, you know, to the front of the room to be heard at the table. So uh, I just wanted to make a setting where we're, you know, we're, we're all in the same boat. And I started to research uh, historical paintings about this because I know that history kind of repeats itself. And I found this painting called Washington Crosses the Delaware. And uh, it's uh, a picture of George Washington kind of leading this boat across the Delaware River during the American Revolution of, uh, you know, I don't know, something like 17 something or other. But uh, it seemed to me that there was a lot of American revolutions happening all at once here during this time. But um, obviously, I wanted to put my own spin on it. And uh, to me, it just seemed like it was a good way to introduce some of the characters that uh, I thought would be better fitting for that, you know, where the, the politician or the leader supposedly is. I put the Hamburglar. Uh, or a hamburger-like <laughs> character, we'll say. Um, behind him is a nod to uh, Picasso's Blue Period, where uh, when Picasso uh, was in his Blue Period, he was painting a lot of people who were uh, very, um, they were starving, they were tired, they were extremely poor. 
<clears throat> and one of them, one of the most famous ones is called the Weary Guitarist, I believe. And uh, I think some people call it the Old Guitarist. And it's a man holding a guitar, still trying to play probably, uh, what do they call him, a busker? And uh, in this one, I have that uh, man holding this, this flag. And then in the foreground, you see a uh, guy uh, just trying to catch a fish, you know, which um, is a is a topic here in the Midwest. There are still, uh, you could say, wars over treaty rights, uh, you know, as far as, um, you know, like native tribes here uh, are trying to practice treaty rights where they want to fish in their traditional way and, you know, being shot at and being, you know, like basically harassed by mobs of people for doing it. So, uh, the the, the um, problem to me is that the foundation, you know, the foundation of how this country has been constructed is, uh, you know, contrary to the equality that we're all seeking here, you know, in, in this current day. And it still, it continues. And I, I think, you know, if you ask me personally, I would say it was because the quote unquote founding fathers of this country set a shitty example, you know, they, they set a shitty example. And uh, that's kind of the attitude that uh, quote unquote patriots hang on to. So I think, you know, my, my meaning behind this is that, you know, we need to realize that we're all in the same boat together. We uh, need to pull it together and realize that, you know, there's a different direction that has to be taken. And uh, until we do that, you know, it's always gonna be a turbulent ride. So uh, in the background, I painted this woman uh, expecting a child. So she's thinking about the future, right? She's thinking about our next generation and she's the only one that sees the lighthouse in this whole scene. Wow. I mean, incredibly powerful, man. Um, you know, I, I love just the the depth of how much, you know, kind of goes into your work and just how much is behind it while still having your very original aesthetic, very aesthetically pl uh, pleasing to me with the bright colors and the almost like cartoony look a lot of times and the infusion of the pop culture references that, you know, are important to you and have inspired you over time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the drop is next week uh, on Wednesday, right? Right. Yep. July 14th. July 14th, Wednesday on Nifty Gateway. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the it sounds like we're not going to talk about the drop structure yet. You know, maybe we, can we allude to anything? Can we give any kind of mm -hmm. clues as to what the drop structure might look like? Yeah, I want. I definitely uh, want to keep mo uh, most of the details uh, quiet for now, just because the curatorial team that I'm working with, who's kind of coordinating everything with Nifty Gateway, are still hammering out the final details. So. I don't want to, uh, you know, mess that up, but I, I will say that, you know, I've been listening. Uh, a lot of the collectors have reached out to me and uh, I've been sitting in the discord rooms very quietly, just making sure that, you know, I, I'm hearing what's going on. And um, as far as the people who have collected my pieces and the people who are collecting my pieces currently, um, I will have, uh, you know, something um, as a token of my appreciation for those folks uh, during that time. And, um, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's something that I would consider some of my my more interesting latest pieces. All right. You heard a little clue from Jonathan there. Um, so everyone, make sure you check out that drop on Wednesday, you know, Nifty Gateway. Um, you know, Jonathan's obviously an incredibly talented artist. Uh, I've actually covered some of the work from his first drop because it's had a very interesting sort of uh, performance on the primary and the secondary market. Um, it was pretty electric, pretty fun. The Kill the Wabbit piece I'm talking about specifically. Um, so yeah, Jonathan, anything you want to kind of close with? Anything you want to lock with man all i want to say is thanks po it's really good to see you again uh, i'm looking forward to this next wild ride and uh connecting with the nft community once again i'll see you guys there Absolutely. Everyone follow Jonathan on Twitter. It's at Jonathan Thunder. I have it on screen here uh, and look out for that drop. Thanks so much for watching.